Hello and welcome, my name is Meeplus, they, she, he, and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are looking at the second volume in the Neil Gaiman Sandman series, The Dollhouse. This volume includes issues 9 through 16, originally published from 1989 into 1990. And it also looks like this collected trade was also initially published in 1990. I gather from poking around online that this trade was published before Preludes and Nocturnes, which was originally not going to be collected into a trade. Obviously, this copy was printed later and is a fully recolored edition. As you may notice, I did use a library book for my volume 1 review, and am now using a previously untouched volume that I own for volume 2. Obviously, I had read this volume before, but I had apparently thought that the plot for this book happened in volume 1. So when I randomly got a Barnes & Noble gift card many years ago and felt under pressure to use it before I left the country, I deliberately skipped Volume 1 and purchased Volumes 2 and 3 instead. Because I really don't like this plotline. Although now that I realize this mistake, I suppose I should buy Volume 1 after all. It'll probably take me another decade to decide. The creative team did stay large to the same, with the writer obviously being Neil Gaiman, art by Mike Dringenberg and Malcolm Jones III, colored by Xylenol, lettered by Tom Klein and John Costanza, plus covers by Dave McKean. For the previous creator's bios, check out my Volume 1 review. New to this volume, includes Xylenol, a company, not a person, who I assume are responsible for the recolored edition, as this is a recolored edition, and John Costanza, an American comic book artist and letterer. He's also done work for Marvel and also lettered on Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. His career started assisting Joe Kubert in 1965 on the syndicated newspaper strip Tales of the Green Berets and has done such diverse work as drawing issues of The Simpsons and lettering Conan the Barbarian. Content notes I wanted to make are primitive stereotypes, racial caricatures, not taking no for an answer, nudity, suicide, stereotypes of madness, torture, animal attack, Eyeballs, serial killers, child predators, dismembering, fatness equals gross and evil, and sexual assault. Although I don't feel this is an exhaustive list. It's one of those kinds of rated M horror urban fantasy titles. I did manage to take much better notes this time, but I still have done more than usual outside reading of other people's opinions to help me figure out the words to articulate how I think and feel. The review includes almost twice as many words as the last one, so that's cool. The arc of this volume mostly follows a young woman named Rose who is looking for her long lost younger brother with a few other seemingly disparate tales mixed in. We learn about the woman, Nada, that dream condemned to hell. There's a maid, mother, and crone reference. We meet Dream's siblings, Despair and Desire, as Dream is tracking down some other aspects of Dream that escaped during his imprisonment. Rose's search takes her to Florida, and she continues to be surrounded by people that give off an oddly threatening aura. There's a serial killer convention and a man who lives forever. The common thread that seems to be connecting each of these stories is desire, with many characters acting on unhindered desire in a way that is in contrast to how people generally IRL operate. Keywords that came to mind reading this volume Myth, multidimensional, dark fantasy, dark humor, and British. Once again, reading this volume went by extremely quickly, although I do feel pretty confident saying that the writing was a tad bit uneven. This book came out fairly early in Gaiman's career, and I do think that is somewhat evident here at the very least. Particularly when Rose initially gets to Florida, things seem a tad bit disjointed, although that didn't stop it from creeping me out. For better or for worse, the kind of horror that Gaiman utilized in this volume has aged pretty well, in my humble opinion, although that might just be a result of me not jumping totally onto the serial killer podcast train. Maybe that would have rendered me completely jaded to this narrative. Of course, there's also the child abuse, which only gets more horrifying as the value and softness we expect to treat children with continues to increase. As elements in a story completely divorced from reality, I think the way that Gaiman writes about these things, hinting at much more than what is shown and not depending on sex or 
overextended graphic violence for shock value has assisted this book in aging well as a horror text if nothing else. The art continues to be my favorite part of this period of horror comics. The original colors versus new colors are apparently a point of great contention. Not to be non-committal, but I feel like they both have their merits, although the new colors probably work better for modern readers. I'll see if I can dig up some examples of the original colors to show here. Of the things I do have opinions on, quality of line ranks very highly. The way the page layouts were used to indicate different things about what is going on in the story is also top notch. Breaking the mold, but in a way that adds a lot and doesn't just feel like complexity for complexity's sake. Moving along to my reflection on different kinds of representation, it is impossible for me to approach this reread as anything but a reader who is coming from a 2021 perspective. Not to say that I have the most cutting edge opinions, but A, I was an infant child when these books came out, so I don't have the context for that. B, I am a fan of the trajectory of modern graphic novel publishing. C, I'm interested in the way this series hits now. This isn't to say that I have not liked the series, even comparing my thoughts from a decade ago to now can feel pretty bizarre. I'm not the biggest Neil Gaiman fan in general, but I will probably still like some of Sandman, even the parts that I never liked, like a lot of this volume, still feel worth my time talking about even if it might not be worth the time of the uninitiated. Is it an unquestionable timeless masterpiece and must read for every serious adult consumer of graphic novels? No. Kicking things off with where we generally start, gender. This volume does follow a lot of female-centered stories. Unfortunately, at least in my opinion, this is also paired with an almost constant threat of sexual violence. Obviously, there is a wide diversity of lines people draw around this sort of representation. For me, while people of all genders can be victims of sexual violence, I have found that a lot of sexual violence in media is either used by authors who think that women are the worst and actually wish violence upon them, or by people who perhaps value women a bit higher but still end up using it a bit flippantly, in my opinion, to establish that things are bad. A lot of this boils down to how dramatically this violence is generally depicted and often at the hands of a stranger. In contrast, my understanding is that most sexual violence is much more likely to be inflicted by someone you already know and much less clear and dramatic. It also seems generally used to advance a man's plotline in some way rendering the women pawns at the center of a story not about them. On the one hand, I realize we want to set up Dream as a morally complex character, but is there no other way besides having Dream tell a woman that he is obsessed with that he doesn't care that she just broke her own hymen to escape him virginity is a social construct and he's more than happy to force himself on her anyway. That one at least is hinted to have happened at least somewhat under the influence of Dream's sibling desire and becomes plot important, I suppose. Later sexual assault will straight up the kind where bad people do bad things, so not something endorsed by the book per se, felt to me to be even less necessary, especially since the Red Riding Hood story was already there and sufficiently creepy. There's also a lot more female nudity than male, and I believe we are still sticking pretty close to the heterosexual gender binary in this volume. That controversial diversity will come in a later volume. Looking at race, albeit from my white perspective, the way non-white characters are used in the opening to the doll's house is more prominent than in the previous volume, but the problems are also multiplied particularly in the way that Gaiman is such a product of a specific space and time, but tries to make Dream universal in a way that reveal the shortcomings of Gaiman's world perspective. Example, having your primitive people be some of the only black people in the book, the tone of this first issue also left me with dead Indian and magical black people vibes as well. This might have been better balanced if we saw more primitive white people and more BIPOC people were included in the rest of the volume. Well, besides the serial killer convention, which has some racial diversity, which doesn't seem very realistic to me, honestly, but leans more heavily into the racial stereotypes. For humor, I assume. And while some of the characters have more or less money, it isn't really an issue. The one exception is perhaps the friend of Dream who ends up living a few hundred years and talks about all the money he has gained and lost. Kind of reminds me a bit of those memes calculating how much money you would have to have earned every day from the beginning of time at an hourly rate to be as rich as Jeff Bezos. 
but that is the closest we get to class commentary slash consciousness. The general level of able-bodiedness seems to have generally increased in this volume, so the current spectrum seems focused on totally able-bodied to supernaturally able-bodied. Otherwise, we just have some pretty vulgar fat phobia where the villain of the final arc is extremely fat, evil, and not terribly bright. Otherwise, I still haven't come across much discussion of the mental health and or neurodiversity representation in Sandman. Hard to believe, but it's true. And that concludes this particular regurgitation of my thoughts and feelings. Anyone else read this who isn't really a Gaiman fan? Bye all, keep reading an organized and capitalist depression. And as always, literally graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.